Well, welcome to church, everyone. It's great to know that we can gather together in unity, even though we're not physically gathered together. And there can be a special unity of the spirit. And we're talking about that today and, and how we can celebrate the God that we have. And I pray that it'll be a blessed time for you. I hope you can take the time to sit down, relax and enjoy our presence together with God and each other during this time. May God bless you. join me as we pray. Lord God, you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. Hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come and may your will be done. While we invite your will to be done on earth, we surrender ourselves afresh, recognizing we need your Holy Spirit 
to reveal the things in our lives that we need to change. Please change our hearts, Lord, to love the things you love and to hate what you hate. Empower us to take every thought captive. Help us to prioritise you in our lives so that we can learn more of who you are, which will only deepen our love for you and further motivate us to be living for you. We thank you that you provided the means of our salvation. We were in a dreadful, hopeless state, unable to fix what we had broken. But you came while we were still sinners and died for us, taking the punishment that we deserved. So we say thank you. Your love and faithfulness is such that we can't ever comprehend. Thank you for drawing us and opening our eyes, our ears and our hearts. And thank you for gifting us with your very presence by way of that beautiful Holy Spirit. The greatest gift we could ever receive is you, and you have blessed us with that. You have also empowered us by your Spirit to be living for you and bearing witness of all you have done. Yet, with all this, we still do the things we ought not do, and do not do the things that we should. So we come before you now with broken hearts and say sorry. There are many of us, Lord, that yearn for our family, friends and colleagues that do not know you as Lord and Saviour. We pray that your spirit will be at work in their lives so that they may begin to seek you. We offer ourselves to be used as your hands and feet to be planting seeds where you call us. But we recognise it is you who makes things grow, Father. So we pray that by the work of your spirit, more will come and follow you giving you the praise and glory as you deserve. So we thank you for those you've already been drawing to our online services, to our home groups and to Alpha. We pray that their roots will, be, will grow deep and strong and that they will bear fruit for you. We thank you for the body of Christ that is united by your spirit. Help us to be loving one another the way you call us to. It is also through our love for one another that the world will know that we are your disciples. So help us to stay connected during these challenging times. I pray that through your word, we will learn more of who you are, that we will be encouraged and that we will be challenged. Thank you for the work you've already done in our lives and we welcome your pruning so that we may bear more fruit for you. We give you all praise and glory and we want to say we love you. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus that we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning everyone, good to be with you. Mark is with us today and he's going to tell us a bit about his story. Mark, you've had a very colourful uh, life, you've had a, a wide range of experiences. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that impacted you and how that's impacting on you today. Well, from a young boy, I was 16, I joined the military and I was in the military to the age of 34, 18 years. And during that time, I had some traumas from from having young people, young bloods die, young, working with me, exposure to toxins and chemicals, mm. up to um, terrorists and when I was exchanged with the British, the IRA blew me up um, in London and some other things happened. Yeah. And so I ended up with what they, what I call the trifecta. Yeah, what's that? Okay. PTSD, chronic PTSD, which oh. I didn't really know. I thought I was just going crazy. Mm. And with that, you get anxiety because you're, you're, ner you're always nervous and jumpy from noises and stuff mm. like that. Mm. And then the big big hit after that is major depression. Yeah. And I wasn't really diagnosed properly until I got out. Yeah. Um, they retired me and put me on a pension. Mm. And I was like washed up, basically. Yeah. So, um, at the time, I had four young children, and my faith in God was there all the time. I was locked, but sometimes I felt like I was on tender hooks, hanging on, mm. calling out to Him for help. And um, mm. I didn't want to, I wanted my children to grow up to be young men and women of God. Yeah. But I couldn't do it. I just, um, so I prayed to God and said, look, these children are not my children, they're your children, and I want them to grow to love and serve you. No matter where it is in the world, 
I want them to do it. And he honoured that prayer. Yes, he has. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. And so it was a struggle. And there was no healing. For nearly 10 years I was pretty bad. Mm. It wasn't until John Redding, one of the pastors here, said to me, he said, have you forgiven these people? The IRA, the terrorists and that. And I hadn't. I had that harbour, that in my heart. Mm. And so I, I, I knew I had to forgive them, but emotionally I was drained. Yeah. So I, I said to the Lord, I said, I need that love to forgive these people. You need to put it in my heart. And I'll give it over to you. Because he says that any burdens or anything you have, mm. you've got to, if you can't handle them, hand it over to him. Mm. And so I took him at his word and I did that. And I said, I need that love. And it was like instant. And I could feel, physically feel it wow. in me just change. Mm. And it was like a, my, the weight lifted off my shoulders and I could forgive them. Yeah. And I have no remorse to these people whatsoever now. Yeah. And the healing process has been going on for years and years. Yes. I have setbacks, like things will trigger me, like um, certain smells, mm. and I'm back there yeah. living it. But I know what it is, and I can deal with it, and I can get my mind off it. Yeah. Um, I used to have really bad nightmares. Mm. My wife will tell you, I've hit her a few times in my sleep, and, mm. and fighting in my sleep and stuff like that. But that's all settled, mm. and he's healing me. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that the message for other people, you may not go through what I went through, but with parents, you need to ha hand things over to God when they get really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Because he'll honour your prayers mm. yeah. if you're fair income about it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, good advice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Nice. G'day, John again. Ricard's uh, the good news uh, equals um, great joy for Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes. Uh, you've heard me uh, speak about this before, but I'm just here today to give you a quick reminder that we have lots of boxes in the middle hall available for use. So each one's got a brochure in it uh, telling you what to put in or what ideas about to what to put in and what not to put in because that's just as important if not more important. We, we hear some funny stories about things that put in and basically the story we got was try, don't try and gazump God, God will use whatever you put in there. Um, there is also a money box which will be in there next to some of these little brochures which will be, uh, you can uh, see in the middle hall. Um, so the money box is for anybody who wants to put a donation, but do remember each box is supposed to have a $10 in it for transport costs, for shipping, uh, etc. A quick story, just after the COVID uh, lockdown set in, um, a lady rang our Sydney boss and said, what are we going to do? We are in desperation, we can't get out to the shops. She was an 86-year-old in a nursing home, she coordinated that, and she is worried about how they're going to do their boxes if they couldn't get out to do shopping. About three and a half months later, she rang uh, Craig up again and said, I've got some boxes here for you to collect. And Craig, being the humble fellow that he is, says, well, you know, uh, I'll come over and she said, by the way, how many boxes have you got? And she said, 400. So this nursing home had done 400 boxes in less than four months. It's the COVID lockdown. Um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing story. And the main thing is about that story is... Craig, only knew, advice he could give her was to pray about it because he didn't know the answers at that point of the game as to how they're going to overcome lots of the difficulties except just to pray about it. And 400 boxes was the response. Um, one of the interesting questions we get asked on a regular basis, where are the boxes going to this year? Well, I've been told that last weekend. It is Cambodia, Fiji, Madagascar and Malawi. I'm also going to tell you another story about a lady from America who used to do boxes quite a bit, but she got this urge that she should go to the Philippines. In fact, she kept on getting messages. She'd open up a magazine and it'd be a story about the Philippines. She'd see a, a bus going past and had, you know, have you been to the Philippines and things like this. And eventually she thought, oh, well, maybe I should go and make inquiries about going to the Philippines just as a tourist. She booked her tickets and away she went. 
When she got there, she's travelling, walking through the markets and this little boy kept on coming up and annoying and she thought, oh, he's only a pickpocket or something like that and didn't, kept on moving and grabbed hold of her purse, handbag very tightly. But this boy persisted, please, lady, please, lady, stop, stop, lady, please stop. And eventually she did. As she turned around to ask him, why are you chasing me so much? He reached into his pocket and pulled out a photograph and it was a photograph of her. He then points to her and says, you my shoebox lady, you my shoebox lady. He recognised her in there and then he wanted to take her home and show her where they lived and how they lived and what the response was from receiving a shoebox. The other thing I need to tell you is that the 20, Sunday the 25th of October will be our closing down Sunday. Um, you can bring them to us before that, uh, they'll be much appreciated but that's when we're going to finish up for this year. Above all, have lots of fun filling the boxes. Like we're getting stories back already about uh, young mothers taking their kids and the fun that the kids have in choosing things to go in a shoebox. So you have fun filling the shoebox and that in turn will bring great joy to some child. God bless you all. Bye now. Hold me now in the hands that created the heaven. By me now, where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pulled me from the clay, set me on a rock, called me by your name, made my heart whole again. Lift it up, and my knees no. I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear. You pulled me from the clay, set me on a rock, called me by your name, made my heart whole again. Here I stand, high and surrender. I need
Greetings everyone. Today's reading is from Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 to 12. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8, Ezra the priest brought the book of law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. To his right stood Mattatiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah and Maasiah. To his left stood Pediah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah and Meshalam. Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbathai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan and Peliah, then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who were interpreting for the people, said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites too quiet, quieted the people, telling them, hush, don't weep. For this is a sacred day. So the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal, to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. Well great to have you again uh, along with us and uh, thank you Jan for reading, uh, particularly getting through a number of those difficult names. Uh, today we look at this passage, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verses 1 uh, through to 12. Thank you to Kevin who last week uh, took us through uh, an earlier passage and uh, looked at the five Ps. If you haven't seen um, that uh, sermon, then please uh, look it up on YouTube there were literally five uh, peas, snow peas, with uh, writing on them. So I'll leave you to, to look at those. Uh, but he also helped us to understand and challenged us with the fact that we need to live in the fear of the Lord. Not uh, fear in the sense of cringing, but fear in the sense of awe and living in the awe of God. As we come to this passage uh, this, this morning, I just want to mention again that, that there were 40,000, around 40,000 that returned 
with Nehemiah to Jerusalem or to settle in and around Jerusalem. So just to keep that figure in mind as uh, they now come to a time of spiritual renewal. The walls have been finished and uh, it's almost like we've... uh, spend a number of different sermons on looking at the walls being built or rebuilt of Jerusalem, but now they've been finished. And you can read about that in chapter 6 and verses 15 and following, uh, where it simply says, so on October the 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. Uh, And now here in our text, before the walls are dedicated, it's almost like God needs to do some renewal in his people, some spiritual renewal in his people. And so here in our text, we have what is called the public reading of the law or the public reading of, of the word of God. Not sure if you recall uh, a time in uh, Israel's earlier history, particular in, particularly in the southern kingdom where Josiah was the king. Uh, Josiah was a good king and he brought reforms. He, he led the people back uh, to God again and, uh, and was a good leader in that sense. But uh, as a part of his kingly reign, things had gotten so bad that the law, the book of the law, is actually found in the temple. They'd lost it. Uh, and so it tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, you can read about it uh, in that chapter, uh, the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law of the Lord in the Lord's temple. And then uh, that scroll is taken and read to Josiah and Josiah's response, uh, having heard uh, the book of the law uh, read out to him, it says he tore his clothes in despair and then ushered orders to, uh, to be fulfilled and eventually that finishes with the people at that time coming and listening to Josiah read the book of the law which was most probably the first five books of the Bible. Here things are not quite as bad as that but I would say that many of the people who amassed to listen to the word around these days had perhaps not heard the the laws of God read before. And so in October, it tells us, verse 1 of chapter 8, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the Watergate. This is not Watergate of the USA. This is Watergate as one of the gates in the walls of Jerusalem. And it was situated uh, down on the right-hand side, down near the bottom, right at the bottom of, of the, uh, the walled city of Jerusalem at that time was the Dung Gate, and just inside of that was the Pool of Siloam, which I'll mention uh, in another sermon soon. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the Water Gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. Here we see Ezra come on the scene and so Ezra and Nehemiah now begin a time uh, together in Jerusalem of leading uh, the people both uh, as a governor and as a priest. So on October the 8th Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. 
from early morning gives us uh, an idea that this would have been close to first light. Until noon, how would you go? Such was their thirst for the words of God, they stood and listened from early morning through until midday. Sadly, we must say, sadly, many Christians, particularly in the Western church, are either like Josiah's time, where the word of God seems to have been lost in their lives, or even here in Nehemiah's time and Ezra's time, where the law of God has been largely forgotten and, 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 uh, and not really been read. Here, though, the people show at this time that they are thirsty for the things of God. And so to the right and to the left of Ezra are a number of officials and it tells us there in verse 5 that Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Let me say just uh, by way of passing almost, how do you treat this I know in many ways Bible just simply means book and that's why we have holy in front of it. It simply means it's a holy book. Biblion is simply the word uh, that speaks of it being a book. But this is a precious book. I make a practice of never putting my Bible on the floor. I try and keep it raised. I keep it up on a seat or on a desk, just as a way in my own thinking of, of, of helping me to understand that this is something precious. Here the people stood and listened to the word of God as a sign of respect. We need to also respect the words in a sense that are, that are written in this book for ourselves to honour and understand that these are the words of God through man to us today. And as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, so change can occur in me and in you. And so this book, which was not a book as we know it, the codex form of today, but rather a scroll, as uh, Ezra unrolls it, so the people rise to their feet. Goes on to say, Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Amen, Amen. We say that at the end of prayers, don't we? What does it mean? It simply means truly. In fact, as I've said before, in Papua New Guinea, they will finish a prayer with itru. Itru means it's true. That's their amen. We say amen, and here the people were saying it uh, a number of times as a way of saying, yes, we agree, yes, we agree. This is true, this is true. Goes on to say, then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. There's a lot to be said for our physical being getting into a space and, and into a place where we can truly acknowledge God. Here we have the lifting of their hands, we have the bowing of them in worship and even going down prostrate on the, on the ground. There is joy that surrounds this time of the reading of the law. And you see that in many cultures around the world, would that we, the church in Australia, might know the same. The reading of God's word has a profound effect on the people they now begin to weep 
as they hear the words of God read over them. And so as the passage goes on, again, there are a number of officials and heads of families that are mentioned, but in verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God and clearly explain the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Understand that the word of God, first of all, comes to our cognition, to our intellect, to our understanding. And here the word of God was being read and they were understanding the word. But then the effect of the word of God moves to the emotion. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who who were interpreting for the people said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the Lord. We can come to the word of God as a cerebral exercise, trying to simply understand it here. But if it doesn't move to our emotion, and as we'll talk about next week, to our action, then it simply stays as something nice to know. The Word of God, as I've mentioned before, is likened to many different things within the Bible. In the book of James, it's likened to a mirror, and it tells us that it gives us a clear picture of who we are, and if we walk away and make no changes, having seen who we are, then what effect is it? What use is it? Over in Hebrews chapter 4, we have that beautiful picture of, of it being likened to a sword. And I don't believe that this passage is trying to help us understand the difference between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. I don't think we're supposed to try and search out what the differences are between those things, But it tells us here uh, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inmost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes and he is the one to whom we are accountable. What is it telling us that the the Bible is there? It's telling us that it is something that exposes us before an almighty holy God. It cuts deep into us and in a sense it opens us up and shows the real us the things that need to be changed, the things that need to be cut out, the things that need to be worked on. Over in uh, the Psalms, David tells us in Psalm 139 that uh, God knows everything about us. It starts off by saying, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. But the psalm finishes, interestingly, by praying, by a prayer, which says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. The word of God is to do that for us as the spirit of God takes the word of God, applies it to our life, gives us a good picture of who we truly are before God and shows us the changes that are needed. But of course, that takes time. And uh, so again, as I have so many times, I urge you to be in God's word, make it a practice a habit of your life to be in God's word, reading, thinking, praying over. 
And so here in the book of Nehemiah, they see their sinfulness before a holy God as the word of God is read over them. The festivals of the Israelites were supposed to be a time of joy and yet here they are weeping and sad as they listen to the words of the law. The word of God pierces their hearts as they hear how they have broken the law and rejected God's authority over them. Some, no doubt, thought through what had taken place in their history. The exiles and all that had taken place with their forebears. For so many years they'd lived under the bondage of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. For others, no doubt, they thought through what should have been. As uh, Deuteronomy was read and other passages were read where God spoke of the blessing and life that would ensue if there was obedience to the law. And yet all of that had gone. And here they were really still captives under Babylon, though living in Jerusalem. And so many would have thought in a sense of regret. Their sadness and tears show out the regret that they had, how debilitating regret can be. Too many Christians today live in a sense under the, under the um, covering of regret We need to find freedom in these things and to move off into freedom again in Christ. Well, the scene changes. The people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. But verse 10 tells us, and Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. Share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so peace, joy and strength are now offered to the people. Verse 9, don't mourn and weep. Verse 10, don't be dejected and sad. Verse 11, hush, don't weep. And so the people are sent off to enjoy this time of festivity. So it tells us here in verse 10, Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy. It's unlike happiness. I know I've talked about this before. Happiness is so often dependent on our circumstances, whereas joy is something deep, that wells up despite our circumstances. This joy that is spoken about here or the joy that the scriptures speak about is both from God and because of God. It is something that God offers us who know him through Jesus, but it's also something that is because of God, his promises, his reality, and so on. This joy is based back into how much we truly believe God's existence and promise. Let me say that again. This joy is based back into how much we truly believe God's existence and promise or promises. And so if my worldview 
holds that God is real, that because of Christ I can come back to God again, that I await the hope of heaven and being with God through eternity, then that deep joy will overcome any circumstance. The psalmist tells us, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, is with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Joy is not dependent on our circumstances. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The word here, strength, speaks of strong tower of a fortified city. That's fascinating, isn't it? Having just finished building the walls. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And we'll look at this a little bit uh, further in next week's sermon, but it's interesting that here, having, having erected the walls and in a sense set up that safety barrier for themselves, God in these chapters is saying, it's not about the walls, it's about your trust in me. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what comes, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Our safety, our security, our meaning, our future, our identity, our existence. None of these make sense apart from knowing God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Knowing that God is sovereign, in charge. Knowing he has a way that is best for us to live. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Knowing he is able to forgive and cleanse. Knowing he is able in all situations to overcome for you and I. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Knowing he is eternal and that heaven awaits as Christians, we should be the most hopeful of all people in these days to stand and let the joy of the Lord be our strength. But the reality is that it's a sadness a lot of times to see Christians who are dejected. They pine for the old days they talk of our country's demise as if we had once been a sinless nation. They speak of victory but seem to live in defeat. And so today I encourage you, don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen.